Hello. Can you all hear me? I have a loud voice anyway, so you probably can hear me. Um, so let's get started. First of all, I wanted to say thank you all so much for being here this morning. This is uh, the first session of the day after the keynote, and I'm like extremely flattered and ever so slightly nervous that you came to this one. Uh, so thank you for coming along. Um, I know that a lot of you in the room are already in the games industry or are hoping to be in the games industry, and I just wanted to take a moment to personally thank you for the amount of work that you've probably put into this week, because I know everyone works really hard, so thank you for coming. Um, and today we're going to be doing a little bit of a different talk uh, about creative direction, uh, and uh, we'll give ourselves a little bit of an introduction. So um, my name is Katie Gall. I am the co-director of the co-director and creative uh, director of Lumi Consulting. We're a games marketing and PR agency. And this is and Emily. My name is Emily Passano. I am the co-director of Burning Last Creative. Um, and we offer game design, production, and narrative services for game studios that need a little bit of extra help. And um, today we want to talk about uh, creative direction because when um, a research agency did a big analysis of 155 plus more than when Gamma Sutra, they realized that game design popped up as a good thing 50% of the time when there was a clear hook and a clear experience for the player, and also conversely popped up as a bad thing, <laughs> a thing that went wrong, when some of the direction was lacking. So we felt like it was important to provide that for the development aspect of it, but also for the marketing side of things. Yeah, it's super interesting for me to work as a marketing person when a lot of the things that I'm actually talking to people about is designing for an audience. And so as a marketing person, I really wanted to be part of this talk on creative direction because I think there, uh, that design and market, marketing are actually a lot closer linked than you think, and I'm hoping to be able to demonstrate that to you. And of course, Emily is going to be able to speak to you from the actual design experience side of things. So what is a creative vision? It's a word that gets thrown around quite a bit, but what is the definition for it? Well, it's not art direction. It's not design direction. It's not any one specific thing. It's meant to be the center of all of the bits that go into making a game. It's meant to be that driving ideal that inspires all of the different disciplines. And that includes how you're going to present yourself to the players. Correct. So all of these <coughs> elements, it's not just about how deeply you think about any one of these elements. It's actually the greatest strategy of how all of these elements work together to enhance each other. So when we're talking about creative direction, of course, it's so many different things from the game design to the genre to the marketing. And it's not only things that are inside of the game for the player to experience, but also the things that are outside of the, ga of the game. So thinking about things like branding, that is really going to affect how well you're actually <laughs> able to sell your game and your product at the end of your development cycle. But you have to start thinking about those, those things much, much earlier in the process of development. And it's, just, just, it's not just about figuring out those things for the sake of marketing. It will actually help you develop the game more efficiently and faster because you know where you want to go. So um, I'm going to tell you a little story. Because when I started out in games marketing, one of the things that I actually found super difficult to find was good, cohesive examples that went from start to finish of a game that were showing why is this such a successful like example? Why is this a successful game? And how do all of those elements actually tie together? So I put together a little case study that I hope will kind of demonstrate my feelings and thoughts. I really think it's a good one, so uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, so I'm going to start you off by saying this is my friend, uh, Will. He does my absolute favorite marketing in the world. He is batshit insane, and <laughs> he, he is wonderful, but uh, I don't want to say too many nice things about him because I'm pretty sure this talk is recorded, and if he ever sees it, I'll be horribly embarrassed. Um, so I'm obviously going to start talking about the Stanley Parable, and this is my other favorite person in games marketing. You would think that it might be a marketing person like my lovely wife in the front here, Lauren Clinic, but in fact, I am very, very much inspired by the overall strategy of what these two people do with their game, because they understand 
that marketing and selling a game isn't just about doing a press release and doing the actual physical tasks associated with PR and marketing. So, of course, they made this game, the Stanley, Stanley Parable, and I'm going to talk to you about the elements of the Stanley Parable that I think make it such a successful game inside for the player and outside for potential, the potential audience, not only the media, but of course potential players, streamers, etc. Um, so if you haven't played the Stanley Parable yet, you better maybe reconsider your life choices up to this point because it's one of the most <laughs> seminal examples of fantastic game design. And I think it uh, does a really good job <coughs> of a couple of different things. So the theme in this game are pervasively about choice and fate. And one of the things that the game does so well um, is it always stays in character in and out of the game world, no matter in the marketing materials or as the player goes through the demonstration or in any of the things that are written on the website, it is always the same tone, the same voice, the same brand and the same words that are used. It never includes something that takes away from the theme. And you're going to hear me actually say this again and again throughout this talk because it is one of the most important things that uh, I think you can do when you're trying to decide if you have a good creative vision or not. And it always asks the question, why is this important to the theme? And those, those things are actually very cr closely related. They're almost the same question. Um, but what I really mean by that is when you're making choices, whether it's about audio or setting or aesthetic or narration or even narrative, why? Why is that narrative important to your specific story? Are you just setting your hero story in a fantasy castle land because you like fantasy castle lands? Or is there a reason that that castle is inherently linked to your story? If you have that link, it's going to be much stronger and it's going to play through all of the other elements of your title. So the Stanley Parable explores one theme in many different ways. And uh, it's pervade, like it pervades throughout all of the different things that you experience as a player and, of course, the things that you see in the media. So starting with um, uh, aesthetic. So the aesthetic, can you, oh, sorry, would you mind um, just tapping on this for me? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yay, help us. <laughs> um, so the aesthetic always reinforces the emotion of the game. So you want to feel sort of desperate and hopeful to get out, but like you have no choice. It's like this dichotomy that you're always faced with in this game. So you always have repeated imagery of these things that you are going past all of the time. You have this dull pallor, this monotonous aesthetic. And you always have like these objects of brightness and lightness to give you some kind of hope. And this theme, this aesthetic, it's not like overly showy. It's not the best graphics in the world. Because why do you need the best graphics in the world for this title? It's not going to enhance the theme of this particular game. So if you just tap one. Keep going. I know, I'm being so complimentary. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, people. Um, the audio, again, reinforces this theme. It reinforces the fact that you are under this oppressor, that you have choice. He gives you hope and then berates you for trying to escape him. It's wonderful. And, and the narrator is such a... It, it only exists in that form. He's not like an overly comical narrator that's trying to guide you through. He's the monotonous narrator. He's the oppressive narrator because... That reinforces the theme of fate and choice and makes you feel and believe that you have hope and you don't. Another clever thing that the Stanley Parable did was think about from the very beginning how to talk about this game without giving away the actual story. So uh, what the creators actually did was they created a demo, and some of you have probably seen this. They made a demo specific for show floors uh, called the Stanley Parable Demo, which was a different game that had the same tone and the same theme. And if people played that, they would get enough of an experience of what the game is going to be like to want to potentially buy it. So I've got a little clip of it here. I'm only going to play a minute to demonstrate it, and I'm going to move on. But the thing I want you to think about is how this marketing is so intrinsically linked to the design and it was released for free. This got over 200,000 downloads, which automatically created an audience of 200,000 people ready and willing to buy that game when it was actually going to be released. Welcome to the Stanley Parable Demonstration. 
Your number is 28. When your number is displayed, please enter the demonstration room. Thank you, and have a pleasant demonstration. Thank you. I'm already excited. <laughs> so I want you to just think about how long of a development time this might have taken. I know for a fact that it took around two months uh, over a cycle of two years of development for the game, and that extra two months got them 200,000 downloads and a potential audience of many millions. You cannot buy that with marketing money, and that was all linked to earlier decisions that they made um, when they thought about the creative vision for this process. Okay, that's enough of that one. Next. <laughs> so the next one I'm gonna talk about is a super interesting example. So this, this example I just showed you is inside the gameplay. So this is to do with the player experience, getting people on board with the story and the tone. What about if you flip that the other way around and you think about, okay, what about people external to the game who are trying to criticize my creative vision or trying to compromise creative vision, what then? So this one is called the Raphael trailer. So um, just for a bit of background, this man, Raphael, wrote into the creators, uh, Davey and Will, and said, oh man, like, your game really isn't very emotional. It's kind of bad. Like, it's really boring. The graphics aren't that great, and I wish it was something completely different. And so instead of getting angry about that decision or, you know, getting uh, harsh, harshly critiquing it or feeling upset, what they did was they took that opportunity to show how strong their actual story and creative vision was, and they turned it into a trailer with a new version of the game, especially created for Raphael, without breaking the narrator and persona that they had created for this game, which I'll show you a little bit of now. You can just, um, yep, you can, yep, yep. Yeah. I recently received an email from a man named Raphael who writes, I just played your game, and I want to say it was the most annoying thing I ever played. It had its cool moments, but overall the experience was only of annoyance. The problem is that it does not touch the heart of people. It's a very emotionless game. Did you ask any girls to try out your game? I ask because they are blissfully less logical than us guys. I am very logical myself, but also very emotional. So it was easy for me to find the game annoying. What happened is that your game frustrated me. I felt like I was being taken into someone else's hallways, doors and plans to deliver me an experience that didn't touch me. And worst of all, I had absolutely no free will in the game. No way to change anything. No impact. No power. I accomplished nothing. People play games because of what they can do inside them. And your game is very good at letting them know they can't do anything. Other things I didn't like were the amount of narrator dialogue too much. And that Stanley is repeated all the time by the narrator. Overall, your game is on a good path, I think. Good luck with it, and best regards, Raphael. You know, Raphael, at first, your negative response to the game devastated me. After all, I managed to squeeze so many emotions into the first game. How could a logical yet emotional person like yourself have been disappointed? But then I realized that much to the contrary, your emotional standard is simply much higher than a normal human being's. So I've come to think of you as a mentor, an emotional beacon toward which I might sail my wayward narrative ship. That's why I've discarded the Stanley Parable as it previously existed and rebuilt it from the ground up to capture not just many emotions, but all emotions. And I think few would disagree that it's a significant step up. Why don't I take you on a little demo walkthrough? <laughs> this is the story of a love samurai named Stanley. In this new version, 
You play the ghost of a dream of a memory of a cyborg warrior trying to find his dead wife inside a poem. The game's central feature, emotion booths. Stepping into any one of these booths will cause the player to actually feel that emotion. And these are just some of the hundreds of thousands of emotions you'll find in the final game. Whereas many video games... Okay, I'm only going to show you that much, but I want you to think about how clever this was because at the beginning when I said they explore one theme in many just different ways, I didn't just mean in the game itself, I meant outside of the game. And this is the perfect example of how somebody tried to criticise potentially the persona. And it, did you notice also that it wasn't the creator that responded to this? It wasn't the voice of the developer who decided to give feedback to this particular criticism. It was the narrator of the Stanley Parable himself. I just think that's so brilliant. And now I'm going to hand it over to Emily. <laughs> so that's indie, AAA. Yeah, so the Stanley Parable did a wonderful job of, of creating this unique world and this strong vision as Katie described. But it's also a very small game. And I want to make it clear that just because you can do it with a small game doesn't mean that scaling it up to a AAA means that you can't do a creative vision. It's just going to have a few more layers and a few more themes and a few more statements that are going to be a part of it but are still going to define the identity of your game. So, Family Parable is about the illusion of choice. What other game is about the illusion of choice? <laughs> <laughs> so, when looking at Bioshock, it's one of those games that has a very, very strong creative vision. It's not as succinct as the Stanley Parable, but there are a few key themes that are very obvious when you play through the game and that have defined the whole franchise, even when they changed the setting with Bioshock Infinite. So, Illusion of Choice is a big part of Bioshock and it defines sort of the gameplay mechanic. It offers you choices between saving little girls or killing them. It offers you um, a very linear level design and makes fun of that as part of that would you kindly narrative where you're in a game and you and I both know that you don't really have a choice outside of what the designers have decided for you. And they take a meta approach to that to make fun of that very nature of a game. And it's also defined by things not being quite as they seem. When you start the game, there's a lighthouse, but it's not just a lighthouse, there's a whole city under it. And it's just not an underwater 1960s city either. It, there was weird science experiments and now you have syringes that give you special powers. And it's not just a little girl. And it's not just a mindless machine that kills stuff with its drill. Everything has several layers and several aspects to its meaning. And that's a big element that defines that creative vision. And when you put them all together, you have the soul of the franchise. So as I was saying a little bit earlier, in Bioshock Infinite, they completely changed the setting. But the setting is not the soul of the game. The soul of the game is that nature of illusory choices and things that have deeper meaning and are more complex than they seem and cause you to question yourself all the way through. So it's a little bit bigger than the one statement of Stanley Parable, but it's still easy enough to wrap your head around so that it can guide the whole development process and the marketing for the game. So we've been talking about, hey, creative vision are awesome. How do we find one? <coughs> They're not going to just grow on trees. Um, there's a few key steps that you can take to get to create a vision with your team. Now, there are several ways to get there. This is one of the ways that we've seen and employed that works really well. And it involves exploring a bunch of ideas, then using them to find common ground, committing to a subset of ideas that you're going to try, and then refining. So what does that look like in detail? When you get started on a new game, everyone is, is excited and everyone has ideas. So 
It's okay to give the whole team, not just the designers, not just the artists, give everyone a chance to find ideas that can satisfy the type of game that you want to do. Pull all of those together, whether it be a mood board, post-its, whiteboard, Lego models, <laughs> anything that you can use to pull all of these ideas and get all of these people together in a room with their head full of creative things. Okay. <coughs> Once you're in the room, what you're trying to do is to find common ground. Find things that are linked to one another. So out of the whole mood board, the thing that Katie and I really loved for our fictional game. It was Tettle. Tettle, it was Tettle. <laughs> yes, it was Tettle. But <laughs> it was also this um, And from there, we looked at things that resonated with both of us. And we started talking about what would be the key things that would define the identity of our game. And that's where we told ourselves in our fictional development studio, okay, we want to make a game that is about folklore, about threats, witches, escaping, which means movement, because, you know, that's a house with chicken legs. Um, Can I just point out that I wanted to make a game where the house was the back of a turtle and you were escaping the forest on the house? <laughs> no? No takers? Come on! Anything is possible at this stage. <laughs> what we're looking at, we had a few ideas of different mechanics that could happen, and from there we extracted not the game design, because game design, that's one discipline. We tried to look at what are the themes that can inspire all of the different disciplines. <clears throat> and we decided, okay, let's prototype these bits. What does what does escape movement and threat mean for the art direction? What do we need to see? Does it need to be very threatening and very dark? Or do we want something more quirky with a turtle? And you can start exploring different ideas, different mechanic, and what they mean. And let's say... Actually, I have one point on this slide. This point in development is often where I see especially mobile developers doing too much because they look at, okay, what are all of the different things that are selling on this platform right now? Like why, um, why do I need a runner that is also a slasher that also has collection and customization and it's got daily rewards and you can share it on Facebook? Like that is the kind of stuff that happens at this step. So be mindful that when you are committing, you're not over committing because that is a serious problem. And once you've done that, it's very hard to undo. And make sure that you're not afraid to commit, too. Because that's also the part where I feel most people get scared and, and kind of stop and stay stuck in the loop. Committing to a set of ideas isn't closing the door. It's getting, giving you a stepping stone to really explore these ideas and build something. If you don't do that, you're just going around in circles. So find what resonates with your team. Find that common ground that the artists, the designers, and coders are like, oh yeah, that would be really cool, and commit to it. Commit to giving you a chance to try it before you start changing it up. And that's the final bit. Refining the creative vision is something that you go as you, you do as you go through development. It's not something that you start obsessing over at the very early stage of finding the very right work. So for example, if we started exploring the mechanic of escaping and movement and we want to create threat, we prototyped gameplay mechanics of puzzles to escape and realized that the very idea of what a turtle is doesn't allow us to create the tension that we want and that feeling of exhilaration. That's okay. We tried the turtle. The turtle didn't wake up. Okay. We're sad. <laughs> But we can strike that from the creative vision and start refining. But when you do that, that's a conscious decision of, okay, we've tried all of these things, let's alter the key statements. Hmm. I think it's important to remember that limitations are an okay thing and defining your game as it moves forwards by those limitations is sometimes going to strengthen it rather than make it weaker. So um, that's also something that I would advise when looking at your creative vision over a long period of time 
um, especially when it comes to uh, later projects like marketing things. If you're trying to do something different than what you're doing in the game, um, look back at those principles and those core things and ask yourself, is the marketing adhering to those same limitations and those same refinements? allows you to figure out what belongs in your game and what doesn't, even when you start prototyping. So instead of just getting excited about one idea and then spending a month prototyping that one, before you go down that route, does it serve any of the points of the creative vision? Is it exploring one of these? Yes, no. And it allows anyone on the team to call anyone else out. So one of the teams that I worked with, the, one of the junior QA, was the vision holder. And when we would have meetings discussing ideas, he would be the one going, hey, which part of the creative vision does that actually satisfy? And sometimes we would realize that we were getting way off the path and it helped us get back in line. And if we felt that the creative vision was too constrained, then okay, we could have that discussion. But that was a conscious change of direction and not just us blundering about trying to figure out what we wanted to Yay. So now, the mission for today. What we want to try to do is Everyone to see this? Over there, if you can't see it. <laughs> is to get all of us to agree on a creative vision for one of these players. <laughs> Usually, we're going to do that in a room of like five people who have researched the idea. So fair warning. This may not work, but we're going to try. And we want you to suggest ideas and think about key elements that could inspire all of the departments working on a game to satisfy, oh no, <laughs> to satisfy these, uh, these players. We're going to give you quick personas, and we're going to be making a mobile game today. We have to start thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the idea here is that Katie and I are going to be um, asking questions and guiding the discussion the same way you should be tackling this challenging bit of discussing a creative vision and coming up with three statements. And hopefully, at the end of this workshop, we will have three statements that we're all excited about. And maybe a game that we can like collectively make together as like a group of a hundred people or so. <laughs> yeah? Revenue share? No? Okay, cool. So here's our personas. So first we've got the Joker. You may recognize him from, uh, I'm not very good at comics, so Batman? <laughs> uh, he's 34, he's a Caucasian male. He wants to prove that morality is a thin veneer. He plays to pass the time before a grand scary entrance. I just love that because I can like imagine him sitting on like a dirty street corner and just like tapping on Candy Crush or something like that. Like, ooh, I've got another two minutes before I have to go and like do this bad thing to the person. He's uh, violently unstable. He's the prince of qu crime and he loves Harley Quinn. And he has an arch nemesis. I feel like that's important. He likes toys and jokes and he is from Arkham Asylum, Gotham City, which is apparently based on New York. So I'm like terribly revealing how much I don't know about Batman right now. So I am super sorry. Please don't come after me. Um, our second persona is Katana, again, a very well-known character who I've read so much about. Um, she's from the movie Suicide Squad, is that right? Somebody? Yep, okay, cool. Um, Suicide Squad, she's Japanese female, she's age 28. Uh, she's very disciplined, she loved her husband. Loved, I don't know if there's a backstory to that, I'm assuming there is. Um, motivated by revenge for his, oh, for his murder. Oh God, I'm finding so much out about this. Plays to maintain the balance in her life. Prefers experiences that she can share with her husband. Um, so maybe a co-op game, I don't know. Um, <laughs> behavior, she's a model, martial artist. She talks to his soul, I'm assuming her husband is trapped in her sword. Oh my God, what a burden on her. Um, and she's from the United States of America. So, um, are we going to do this with a show of hands? I think, I think we should do it by standing up because you need a little bit of energy. Okay, to sweet. Ideas okay, so what are we going to do if it's like 50-50 though? Are we just like going to make a... Make it 
That's not going to happen. This is going to happen. I'm not worried about that. Okay. Um, so, but what if we ask for one first and there's like a bias or something? Oh, come <laughs> okay, on. okay. <laughs> okay. Stand up, please, if you would like to do the Joker. Oh my goodness. I was not expecting that. Okay, we have three wonderful humans who have sacrificed their life to the Joker. Okay, please stand up if you would like to do Katana. If you all don't stand up, I'm going to be very upset with you. You're at the back there with the beanie. I see you. That's right. Okay, very good. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. I was not expecting that. I am a little bit worried because I don't know anything about Katana, whereas I knew something about the Joker. So, okay. We were making a game. I'm like... It'll be fine. Yeah. I'm supposed to know, like, I'm supposed to be the person that's like, yeah, I know exactly who my target audience is. No, I don't, not in this case. So I'm just as clueless as you guys. <laughs> All right, oh. so go, we'll Emily, have go fun on. With it. Um, so, Katie's going to be taking. Um, oh, no. Oh, no! No! <coughs> um, hopefully, taking note, notes on this as we go. Um, you can also use the Twitter hashtag directionless if you want to, but I feel like we're friends enough that you can <laughs> just speak up. Um, so, the idea is try. So think about Katana for a second. So Katana has had a hard life. Her husband is dead. He was killed by her magical sword. His soul is trapped in the, so the sword. She can talk to him. That's all they can do. <laughs> I think her husband is like actually in camp. But if he's yes. Dead, it's like him. <laughs> he has no <little> eyes. <laughs> but they can talk together. Um, she's leading a fairly violent life, seeking revenge, but at the heart, she's a martial artist, so she's all about keeping balance. So, what experience do we think Katana would enjoy? What do we feel she would play? Something called? <laughs> a fighting game? <laughs> Oh, that's good. So her, her particular catharsis is then coming to terms with the death of her husband, or do we want her to achieve vengeance in a game? Well, I think the fact that she's speaking and communicating with her husband doesn't really feed into that game. I would say it's more about the catharsis of revenge in this situation. I think that's possibly more towards what she's looking at. So then we'd be inspired by giving her an out within a game of what she's trying to achieve in life as well. Maybe if it's going to be cathartic, something that will take on an emotional journey to a degree. She feels like she needs to relive that so she can get past the experience. So emotional journey to, through grief? Maybe. If she's out to vengeance, doesn't that suggest that she's working her way through a list of targets which would be like so kill being a lot of Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's... Depression. That's her life, though. So do we want to play a game vengeance. that is our life, or do we play games to escape from life? I think it'd be interesting if we play on the imbalance of martial arts being the defense and her husband being the sword. If she likes doing what her husband likes doing, and her husband's a sword, she <laughs> <laughs> killing people with a sword. So he's not. The sword traps souls, and there are like a, hundreds of them in the sword. Her husband is one of them. I'd be interested to see if you can play on how that changes people. Okay. It's just a thought. Yeah. She's super violent and I'm five, so I reckon a dating scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on board with that. I'm ready to move on, she's still all going for her. And she dates like different swords or something? <laughs> Considering a husband doesn't actually have input into the game, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it's just a bit of like, 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 like
Charlie, yo. Yeah. Yes. Something similar to like how Jackbox allows people to watch them as they're making submissions and then you can have input on the, the person who wins. Yeah. At the end. Or maybe something co op, if we can make yeah. that work with someone who can't actually use the yeah. controller. What about like a, a sexting game between her and her sword husband? <laughs> trying to extract what are the essential bit. I think the idea of doing something that somehow includes the husband, whether as a spectator or a participant, is something that has come up a few times. And then that can be it as a statement. We don't need to know exactly how he's going to be involved. That's something that we can prototype and figure out. What's important to us is that we want to help them have this connection and shared activity. Does that sound like a good statement yeah. that we're all in agreement with? Yes, one down! <laughs> okay. try to extract it to a general theme that can help art as well. Is that still tied to we want to create an interaction between her and her husband? Oh, okay. I guess going more back to the treatment, kind of like how trying to express stuff like that, that more communication between the okay. father and like the father's a bowling ball and her. Yeah, so that co-op aspect of the game is what you mean. Okay. You could Link it. You could you could look at a more sort of broad picture and go, okay, well, it's about control over her body and the like the the dichotomy between like somebody has control of one element of gameplay and the other, and it's got to do with communication, like a more control based kind of theme. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Just trying to like bring it back out. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's kind of the if you pay attention to the type of questions that I'm asking. It's what are the common grounds, what are the overarching themes that aren't specifically a mechanic or an art style, but something that can inspire everyone working on this project. Tim. Um, oh, me? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about the fact that the husband is kind of there, that he's not there, right? I'm thinking that maybe um, you might be able to work some biofeedback into the game somehow, um, which is creating states with the player and when those states are achieved on a biological sense, heart rate, breathing, that kind of thing, then that's when the husband is there or that's when communication lines are just really 100% here. Do you know what I mean? Ah. Like, kind of feedback element for that connectivity. Yeah, so kind of through that experience as you're, you're playing, you have that feedback of how well in tune with your collaborator you are. and her sword is a split personality she's made after the loss of her husband. Freddie is not split personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. You came, you came in at a bad time with that one. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> also, 
also, this is what, what you just proposed, is redefining who she is. She is not a character in the game. She is the player. So we want to look at what type of game we want to provide for her, not a gameplay that isn't that features her, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I want, to, I want to reinforce that whole the carving thing. I think the whole idea is the only connection they've currently got is violence to actually experience other parts of their relationship is that they want to have an experience that they can connect and in a calm way. Mm. And just, I want to reinforce that push in that direction. Is so it, maybe some kind of rhythm? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I, just to feed into the bio that. Sword guitar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could do like a life is strange style time. Like not time travel necessarily, but like a different decision leads to different things and then that you communicate with sword husband. Like okay, you do one thing. Oh, did that work the way you want it to be? Sword husband, like well try this other thing. Yeah, so having these elements of communication, I think all ties back to what we were talking about earlier. So we want to create some type of collaboration. I really like the um, how you narrowed down that idea of it's not just some type of collaboration, it's a new type of collaboration for them that is, that is outside of the violence that they currently know. Like not able to be a bodily communication, like because they're two different beings now? Yeah. possibly less of emotion. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe Katana wants to move on from her. She's been dead for a while. So maybe a good core thing for the game might be healing. Ooh, I like that. Hmm. Yeah, that could be interesting. Because that's also healing like the nature of their current relationship. It's not just her through grief, like came up earlier as well. It's also who they are now as people, so that he's not resentful of not having a body anymore <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that could be really interesting. I was going to say, it seems like so far we've mostly been focusing on the motivation of, the, of Katana, but not the sentient sword that also has its own emotions. Whether they've got a shared goal or they've got their own kind of little goals, like maybe he doesn't care so much about vengeance, he wants sort of like, uh, I don't know, uh, recovery. I just love the idea of like a really sad sword that is like tortured by the fact that it's a device that is a killing device, but it just like doesn't agree with that politically and it's stuff. Or maybe he's like, fuck yeah, I'm a sword. That's, that's no. really beautiful. I like that a lot. Okay, so we've talked about creating some type of collaborative experience. We've talked about getting something that is a little bit more um, zen and calming, themes of healing, potentially. What else? So if we break away from iteration on calm and cooperative, what are the other things that we feel should define this game? I think like if we boil down like the player's skills, um, Movement and motion is one of the uh, biggest things. Mm -hmm. Since she's so good at martial arts and stuff, and the idea of a sword as well, which is a sword without motion, is interesting. Oh, so the the yeah. interesting contrast of her being all about motion and him ultimately cannot move without her. There's yeah, and like and like to give a sword meaning, you have to yeah. swing it. Um, so you could double up on that with the. Sort of husband wife relationship, what can't they do alone that they need each other to do? It's probably diving away from the tech a little bit, but if I, need, I need a body to swing at something and I need a sword to cut something, so it could be cooking game. So, one of the things that, that could be done, for example, would be kind of flip their skills around. So, the sword who can never move on their own, maybe can move the character through voice, and Katana, who usually is all about movement, then needs to figure out how to do something else and kind of walk a mile into each other's shoes through the game. One player shakes the, the mobile, the other person forks the door. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if it requires movement, isn't something that makes sense in just VR? Have something connected to the sword, so like it plays as that analog, while she does like the character as a VR, so when she swings something, it controls something. And she... It 
could, but the parameter is to do mobile. So I wouldn't expand it to VR, just for the sake of that. Sorry, not VR, but what's that thing that you put on your phone for example? Yeah, that cardboard thing. Google, Google Cardboard of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. okay. So we've got about another like five minutes before questions. So yeah, um, cool. Uh, Katie was just reminding me that we're starting to run out of time, but um, as you can see, um, we have a lot of things that kind of yeah. rose to the top. Um, and when we think about elements of that creative vision of you know collaboration, a bunch of different mi mechanics came up a bunch of different um, ways to implement it technically, whether um, you want to do you know, motion tracking and stuff like that, or whether it needs to be super accessible and be voice activated. That's a lot of tech work. Um, and it also impacts what you want to show on the screen um, and how you want to communicate your gameplay if you want to, to enable that collaboration. The whole idea of something that is zen and calm that may dictate mechanics that are more puzzle oriented. We talked about skills because she's all about mastery. Um, and also an art style where you don't want to have super clashing colors. You want to create this peaceful environment. So a lot of the things that came up and the general ideas that could be boiled down into creative vision statements, as you can see, are multi-layered. Zen is also sound design. <laughs> and it's also the way you're going to communicate your game upward and who you're trying to reach out to. So this is the slide that you want to take a picture of. Um, these are the things that we wanted you to kind of experience through the discussion, looking at what is this game similar to? A lot of people compared, oh, this could be like this, or this could be like that. What, are, what elements that were brought up work together, and how do they work together? Can your game idea happen in any other setting, or is it unique, and are you making choices that make it unique? Um, leaving yourself room to explore. So part of that vision statement shouldn't be, oh, the mechanic needs to be this. It should be broad enough so that you can start prototyping and figuring it out. Um, not obsessing over the perfect words. We threw a lot of ideas out there and we went back and forth and we switched things up and sometimes we clarified certain things and others we just left broad and that's okay. Because it's okay if not everyone interprets the vision the exact same way. That'll spark discussion. That will spark ideas as you start developing it into an actual game. And when you guys came up with specific games mechanic, a lot of what I did would ask you, why? Why this mechanic in particular? What purpose does it serve? To pull you back at that high level. And then once you know the, these elements of your vision, you should prioritize them to know which one you absolutely don't want to move and which ones can change. So in the idea that we just had, maybe um, the idea of creating a collaborative environment between Katana and her husband is the thing that no matter what happens, we don't want to sacrifice. The fact that it's Zen, the fact that it's healing, these are all good, we'll do our best to put them in there, but they're second priority. Because if we find a good gameplay that isn't quite zen, but really hits all of the other points, maybe that's more important. Do you want to? <laughs> this is just so we're just reiterating what we've gone through already. So lim let limitations guide you. Don't be afraid um, of reducing the amount of things that you're trying to do. Um, it's a lot easier to have one or two or three things rather than five, six or seven when you're at the end and you're trying to expand those themes into something greater, like the story that you're telling your potential players, etc. This art installation actually only works when there's wind. That's what it's based on. It's set amongst buildings. That is a really windy corner and then it'll just go in the wind and create 
create that experience. It's a limitation of its context, but it's also the mechanic by which it works. So it's not stopping. It's pushing you to be more creative and do new things. Yeah, she committed. <laughs> don't overcommit. <laughs> um, but make sure you don't forget about your ideas that were at the core of your project halfway through because you'll end up with a product product that reflects that. Um, and there's nothing harder than trying to sell uh, something that doesn't have a clear vision. So definitely think about this and the choices that you make throughout development and how they're going to impact later uh, potential activities. Whoop. Um, the creative vision, through its very nature, becomes an assessment tool of telling you what belongs and what doesn't. Hello Kitty doesn't belong in Bioshock. Pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> but sometimes when you get deep into development, that's the challenges. It becomes blurry. You don't quite know what fits and what doesn't. And having a clear vision you're trying to reach for is going to help you keep the bearing. Awesome. And um, yep. And this is just going again into what I was talking about before. How does your design and your story that you're trying to tell exist outside of your game world? So uh, how do you communicate that to potential players? And how is your design going to innovate and creatively show that to your audience? Thank you. So we left about like three minutes for questions. So if either or either of you, either of you, two people in the room, <laughs> if any of you have a question uh, about either of our disciplines in relation to creative vision, please feel free to ask us. I promise I won't ber berate you very much. We're usually friendly. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? Cool. I taught you everything you know. You just remember that when you leave this room. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, guys.